Hello everyone and welcome to Le Labo de J. This video is going to be quite different and will be more oriented towards my post-production friends. You're a graphic artist, an editor, a colorist, whether working in the field of post-production or creation of video content. You have some serious issues with gamma and color shift when you go from a software to another, from a player to another, from a browser to another. You have heard of QuickTime bug but never understood what it was. You've scored all the internet looking for answers. This video is made for you. But first, jingle intro. First and foremost, this video is the result of a lot of experimentation and research. But it won't be fair to take the sole credit for that because I consult a lot of people like colorist, diop, color scientist, and they all helped me for making this video. I also look at a lot of video and look at forums to seek answers. So all my sources will be credited at the end of the video. This video will be divided in three parts. First part, I will give you a brief summary of basic concept that will help you to understand what's really going on. Because it's good to push some buttons, but without understanding what you are doing, you will never be able to find a cure. In the second part, I will expose through various examples all the kind of problems that you can face. And finally, in the last part, we will see how we can solve some of these problems. But be aware that there is no unique solution. Be aware that the following demonstration is done on the latest Mac Pro on Catalina. Not on Big Sure. I know that on Big Sure there is some color management improvement. So you may find differences from an app to another and from an OS to another. So basically, how an image is displayed. Uh, this goes through a whole pipeline. It starts with an encoded file. The encoded file is decoded and decompressed by a software. RGB values are created, then they are sent to the GPU. The GPU will maybe apply change on these values, re-encode them and send them through a used standard. It can be 422 YCBCR or 444 RGB. Display controller will receive the data and decode it from the HDMI display port, stream into electric signals, which then get converted into visible light and color by the respective display technology. How your image will be displayed depends on many factors. It relies on gamut, transfer curve, bit depth, and also the environment. Quantifying the subjective perception of an image is quite hard. When we talk about a file, a display, or a camera, we have three characteristics that makes a color space. The gamut is a three-dimensional volume that defines what color and their respective luminance a set of RGB values can describe, usually with a value between 0 and 1. So for example, an RGB 100 will be a complete red image. But to know what actual red is described, we need to establish a numeric relationship with physical light waves, which is what the gamut does. The second attribute is the transfer curve. The transfer curve, you might have heard of it, it's EOTF or OETF. When you capture an image, you go from light to electric, then to electric from light. Light through electric is optoelectrical transfer friction, and electric to light is electrical opto transfer function. And the third characteristic is the white point. White point is the chromacity of white, usually produced when R equal G equal B. It can be approximated with its correlated color temperature. This is measured in Kelvin. D65 is 6004 Kelvin. DCI is 6300 Kelvin. There are a lot of different standards that have been set by different organizations concerning different types of displays and viewing environment. For HD video and broadcast encoding and delivery, we have ITU RBT7096, a standard based on REC709 primaries, a compound curve, which means a compound of both linear segments for blacks and an offsetted gamma approximative of 2.22 for the rest of the curve. So the overall gamma is close to 1.9 and 2 but we will come back on this later. And a white point of D65. A majority of colorists now use power low gamma 2.4 to match with modern display device and darker environment. For display, a lot of TVs still decode with gamma 2.2. The BT1886 EOTF was introduced in 2011. 
it's a variable gamma curve closer to a gamma 2.4 that change in the shadow, taking into account the black levels of the display. European Broadcast Unit, EBU, set the gamma curve to 2.35. This taking account of the linear part of the curve in the black and the rest of the gamma curve is 2.2, but gamma 2.35 is rarely used. An image displayed in a dark environment with a gamma 2.4 will give you the same perception if you look at it in a brighter environment with a gamma 2.2. For HDR TV, we have two standards for encoding signal. HLG, based on REC 2020 primaries, and OETF Arrive STD B67, with a wide point of D65. And for the other HDR flavor, we have REC 2020 primaries, the OETF based on SMPT EPQ 2084, and D65 wide point. The decoding is done via REC 2100 HLG or REC 2100 ST2084. REC 2100 ST2084 stands for HDR10, HDR10+, Dolby Vision, and SL HDR2. REC 21 HLG stands for HLG and SL HDR3. Now for computer devices and also internet images, we have the sRGB color volume. The sRGB gamut is equivalent to REC709. Curve is a compound between a linear portion and a gamma of 2.4, which results something close to gamma 2.2, and white point is D65. For decoding, we have a little trick, as most of monitors sRGB utilize power low gamma 2.2. sRGB EOTF was referring to older CRT. Newer Apple devices have a display system called P3 Display. The color space is P3 D65 with a sRGB transfer curve. And finally, for digital cinema, for encoding and decoding, standards are DCI P3 with a gamma 2.6, P3 D65 for display, P3 DCI for theater with a white point of 6300 Kelvin, and P3 D60 for ACs. Okay, so from there you understand that if you grade a content on a REC 709 gamma 2.4 monitor, and then you encode your file with this standard, this is not made to be watched on a sRGB monitor or Gamma 2.2 or Apple P3 display. Indeed, the color coding and the transfer curve are different. Moreover, if you associate the wrong curve with the wrong space, the image will not be displayed correctly. So we need something to adjust it for us. The goal here is to preserve the creative intent of the author. We are now going to talk about two barbaric terms, the full range and the video range. They characterize the type of level of information contained in the signal. Older analog devices would deliver a range video signal. Items generated by computer as well as images scanned from film were in full range. On an 8 bit scale, the video range is coded from 16 to 235. On the full range, it's from 0 to 255. On 10-bit values, video range is coded from 64 to 940 and on full range, it's coded from 0 to 1023. We will consider that a video monitor will display in video level and a computer screen in full range. So whatever your signal is, when you go from an app to another, your signal is transformed and scaled. But normally, it's totally transparent. Obviously, there are pitfalls. For example, some codecs such as ProRes 444 suggest encoding in video range, but they can be also encoded in full but some applications will always consider ProRes as video range. So if it's a full range signal, it can be clipped or not decoded correctly. Now let's talk about Apple Color Management. It's done via ColorSync, a part of macOS that will convert any source to the ICC profile of your screen defined in the system settings. Or even using calibration profiles, ColorSync will convert on the fly to properly display, for example, your QuickTime file by converting the original color space to the color space of your display. This works for UI elements, software, viewer, etc. So color syncs has to know the source color space of every pixel in the system to manage the color accurately. A QuickTime file has metadata called NCLC. The NCLC is defined by three values. The first, the color primaries, which corresponds to the gamut. The second is the transfer curves. And the third is the color matrix, which is responsible for converting the YCBCR encoded data to RGB pixels. For an example, when you have a QuickTime rendered in DaVinci in REC709 and Gamma 2.4, the ties is 1 to 1. 1 is for the REC709 gamut. The 2 correspond to the unspecified transfer curve, 
which has been assigned to a Gamma 2.4 in a separate metadata column, and one is for the matrix color Rec709. You can see it by clicking on Command I. A quitant file with a tag 1131 corresponds to an sRGB color space. And now, what you will find the more often on macOS is a tag called 111. Rec709, Rec709, Rec709. But be careful because there is a trick. The Rec709 curve refers to the ITU RBT709 OETF, which means the compound gamma curve with a value set between 1.9 and 2. Let's say 1.95. Now that you know the difference between a gamut, a transfer curve, a quick time time, video range, full range, you have a vague idea of everything that can corrupt your workflow. For this demonstration, I created a little sequence with patterns and elements that will show us what is really going on. As you can see, I'm in a standard condition with an sRGB monitor in Gamma 2.2 and a reference monitor set in Rec709 Gamma 2.4. For this demonstration, I have set all my workflow in full, so what will I measure on this uh, video monitor will be the same that I measure on this RGB monitor. RGB value will be the same because results work in full. It converts everything in full internally. I will have the correspondence, except for few units, between my viewer and my monitor, which is also set to display full. As you can see, the parameters match. I'm going to switch back to a regular workflow. Unless you work on ACES workflow or Dolby Vision workflow, most of you don't work in full range. And I don't want to add a level of complexity. So let's skip the full workflow and get back to the video range. Basically, all DaVinci Resolve projects are set to Gamma 2.4 and Rec 709 by default. So this demonstration only will take care of SDR content. During the demonstration, I will use a little tool, which is a color picker. It will measure 8-bit RGB values of the files that I'm going to render. That will allow us to represent the shift from a file to another. So I'm exporting my reference file. I open it, and as we can see, it's a QuickTime correctly tagged 1 to 1. Now let's analyze the signal with this wonderful tool, Knob Omniscope. When we look at the signal, we can see that everything is in place. The ramp has a linear representation. If I select a few values, we can see that I find what I have on my flanders. Obviously, I assume that for this demonstration, all displays are set and calibrated correctly. There are too many parameters, and the only thing I am focusing here is the consistency of the chain of the file. In order to obtain uniformity, I will set DaVinci so that the viewer takes into account the color management performed by macOS. As you can see, if I compare my QuickTime export with my Resolve GY, it doesn't match. By going to Preference, General, I check Use my Display Color Profiles for viewers. I quit and restart Resolve, and you can see that the two displays now match. This only works when your display or output color space is the same as the tag on your export. So far, all is good. So first magical trick, I'm going to open my file on QuickTime and then on VLC. You can see that the two do not display the same image. Second magical trick, I'm going to open Chrome, Safari and Firefox. I drag the same source file into each browser and we see that there are differences too. Now let's open the display preferences. Basically, I'm in an sRGB because my screen is sRGB. I ask for a crazy profile, normally color sync will activate and try to compensate. In this case, it cannot be done because my file and my screen have nothing to do with the selected profile. But watch what happens. In that case, the video captured is showing the exact opposite of what's happening on my screen. In the reality, those two, VRC and Firefox, are not color managed. That's why they don't change. So let's go on. Imagine uh, one of my clients was not in the grading room, so I have to send him a uh, compression. I go through handbrake, doing the export, and boom, the encode looks different in QuickTime. Why? Because handbrake changed the tag. My QuickTime went from 121 to 111. Yes, I know what you are thinking about. Handbrake is a free tool, so let's go into another application like Adobe Media Encoder. 
So if I compress with media encoder, again, the QuickTime is retagged and the appearance change. So now let's go in Premiere. When we import the file, we find out that the image is not displayed correctly. We have to activate an option here. What we'll do is set the viewer gamma to 2.4. This will tell ColorSync that those pixels in the viewer are supposed to be 2.4 and not sRGB, which is default. This only concerns the display because as soon as I export, the tag will be modified to 111 and the display will not be looked correct in QuickTime. Add a buffer effect, same. Even if you specify a Rec 709 Gamma 2.4 workflow, the tag will be modified on export. Final Cut Pro, the display is telling the OS that everything is tagged 111. No further color management is done. But I'm not expert in Final Cut at all. However, on export, the tag is modified to 111 again. Nuke is manual, as you can choose input and output tags yourself. The output from the viewer is internally tagged as sRGB, so we have to fitting display. But the tag is modified on export again and it's 111. It seems that you can modify with Python tools, but on standard mode, you cannot. Let's have a look at Flame, my favorite tool. In legacy, there is no way to have a matching display. When exporting, the tag is transformed. If I switch to a simple linear workflow, or even a workflow in ACES, I get a consistent display. Although the Flame viewer shows the export correctly, the tags are changed, and all the file display difference from the source. So, I didn't uh, test all the application on macOS, but most of the most used application in post-production retag QuickTime. Consequence, all the rendering from those applications from Rec. 709 Gamma 2.4 are displaying differently in QuickTime from the original source. Only grading applications like Resolve, Baselight and Scratch keep the tag correctly when rendering. So basically, what's going on? ColorSync will read the tag in order to do the conversion and display the image, except that the info given to him is false. So instead of having a 2.4 gamma info, he sees a Rec. 709 transfer curve referring to a gamma of 195. It will convert 195 to display as 2.2 on your sRGB screen, thus producing a brighter picture. Here is the famous QuickTime bug, but technically QuickTime is not responsible. All the apps are modifying the tag. That's it. ColorSync only do conversion on the fly, but it does it from a wrong information that was modified by those apps. In fact, it's impossible to see what is really correct unless you have a reference display. So from now, if you are not aware of this, your workflow can be seriously compromised. So if you send uh, your render to your clients, your clients will see a brighter image and will ask modification. Modification that your colorist will find completely stupid because the two of them don't see the same thing. So, Everything is broken from here. A small detail, if you are grading in Resolve and a client asks you to export some stills to send to another uh, people in the agency, the still that you are exporting, they are in sRGB. So they are not matching your Rec. 709 Gamma 2.4 monitor. Why? Because you have to convert your sRGB profile to Rec. 709 Gamma 2.4 to have uh, the file accurate to your reference profile. Okay, so now you have to understand something very important. There is absolutely no unique file that will fit every case scenario. So if you want to have an accurate representation of what you did during the color session, you have to difference what is your target. If you deliver for web or if you deliver for TV, this won't be the same file. So first, let's explore a workflow to deliver for TV. First thing, fix the tag. Rule number one, do not modify your graded image. The metadata is just for viewing on QuickTime. Changing the render can have a serious consequences. If we look at the image of the source and the image of the version we have modified the tag on only scope, we see that there is no difference. 
Indeed, also visually, these images are different when played back with QuickTime. They are actually the same. They are not different. Let's import one of these films into Resolve and put ourselves into a color managed project. If I import the source and an exported version of Handbreak, we can see on the scopes that the signal is very different. Yet, it's the same picture. See if I modify the tag of the transfer curve and bring it back to the original Gamma 2.4, I have exact same picture. If I go into a standard project, the conversion will take place on its own. You just have to render by checking that the output tag is equivalent to that of your timeline, namely Rec 709 and Gamma 2.4, and you are done. Another solution that does not require re-rendering go through a small utility named AMCDX Patcher. We open the file, we go to the metadata tab, we change Rec709 by unspecified, we apply, we do the same here, and then apply a Gamma 2.4, and then we apply. We close the file, we open it again, and then your tag is repaired. And your image is displayed the way it was intended. Et voilà! Obviously, only do this if you need to. Keep a check on the tags exported by various encoders and such. You need to make sure that the viewing environment of the person you are sending matches the encode. And it will only work with QuickTime on Mac. Now, let's focus on the web and it gets more complicated. So, let's see what happens if we upload a version with modified tag. As you can see, it's not displayed correctly anywhere. You will never be able to match QuickTime, because when the file is encoded for web, playback, all known platforms retags everything as 111 or gamma 1.96. So you are seeing your image that is transformed from 1.96 to your display, which is not what we want to see, and the result is an image too bright. So we are going to study three case scenarios. First one, the Rec 709A fix. The goal is to transform your Gamma 2.4 to a Gamma 2.4 correctly displays when QuickTime is retagged 111. In fact, we are going to convert the Gamma 2.4 to Gamma 1.95. So is it really the advertised miracle solution? So let's go to Resolve and do a color transform and change the timeline from Gamma 2.4 to Rec 709A. Then we are exporting with tagging Rec 709, Rec 709A. So you see, if you go to Flame, After Effects, Premiere, and whatsoever, your file will be displayed and exported correctly. Does it work on VLC? No. Does it work on Firefox? No. It works only on YouTube, on Chrome, and Safari. It's not working in Firefox. In Vimeo, it doesn't work. If you go on iOS, it's not working anywhere. If you go on Windows, it's not working. And if you go on Android, it's not working. If we watch the video on Nubscope, we see that the ramp has undergone a transformation. The curve has slightly changed. Caution, never apply a Rec 709A for deliverables for TV. So the Rec 709A only work on macOS color managed application. Now let's look at second option, the sRGB fix. Let's try to convert to sRGB. We go back to Resolve and we do a color transform in order to convert the timeline and the gamma to sRGB and tag sRGB. So this time, we can see that QuickTime and VLC display the same thing. YouTube does not work, Vimeo and Firefox work. On PC, it works almost everywhere. On Android, it works almost everywhere and on iOS, it works also everywhere. The only thing is that the conversion to sRGB by its nature will generate posterization on your file. The coding of the highlights and shadow will be less precise. If you are looking at the image on the scope, we can see that the curve is transformed quite significantly. The sRGB fix only works on Mac if your display profile is set to sRGB. And don't forget that these files are tagged 131. So from an application to another, tag can be ignored or modified. So now let's consider the last ultimate solution. Knowing that the sRGB and the Rec 709 share the same gamut, but the sRGB curve introduce some problem, why not stay on the power low gamma curve and tag the file 111? We go to resolve, we transform the gamma from 2.4 to 2.2, 
and we tag rec 709 a Of course, what we will obtain is something hybrid, but it will be able to be correctly played back on macOS QuickTime and on the web uploads. It will also survive re-encoding without retagging. Finally, let's say this looks like the least distant from what we grade on most screen as we find a good middle ground. It's not 100% accurate, that's why uh, the checks are not green, they are purple. It's really the middle ground and the best we can do uh, to survive all this world and all these apps and browsers. The ultimate fix, you are delivered from problem of tagging, you are close to the original grade, but on color managed application, it can appear quite bright. So in summary, you have 50 solutions for 50 different viewing environments. If you want to be as faithful as possible, you have to impose a restricted workflow. Impose to your clients to watch your file on platform where you know your file will be decoded correctly. You will always be shared between Windows, Android, Linux where there is no color management and macOS where there is color management but it's not consistent because it's not the same on iOS. The only way to watch a content and to grade the content accurately is to go from a computer through a video card with a SDI cable then go to a video monitor. There is then no color management. Of course, your monitor has to be calibrated. If you watch a content made for a TV, review your content on a TV. It's as simple as that. You have some consumer TV that can be calibrated by a very powerful tool like Light Illusion Color Space. You can generate 3D LUTs and have a really accurate display. If you are making delivery for web, then prefer a content closer to sRGB. You can deliver a ProRes 422HQ Rec 709 Gamma 2.2 tagged Rec 709 Rec 709A. For all conversion, Resolve is your friend. You can assign and modify color space and curve separately only if you know what you are doing. And finally, always check that what you are rendering is consistent with your source. This video is now over and I would really like to thank all the people who helped me from making this video. First, Finn Yeager. Finn is an absolutely wonderful person. He helped me a lot. He made some sessions late at night, explained me all the pitfalls, all the tricks on Flame, on Resolve. He even correct uh, my English translation for making this video in English. So thanks a lot to him. Once again, this video would not exist without him. I would like to thank Cedric Lejeune, Troy Sobotka and Remy Ashar for all their help and valuable information about the curve and their behavior. I would like also to thank Daniel C. Reguzano for his wonderful video about color management with QuickTime in Light. I would like to thank Dan Sriunga for his help and this wonderful article he wrote about full range and legal range. You can find it on his blog thepostprocess.com. I would also like to thank Joseph Slomka from Photochem for his help. And finally, Walter Folpato for his wonderful advice. If you make something for TV, don't judge it on the computer, judge it on the TV. And now I have a personal message for Apple, Google, Microsoft, Adobe, Autodesk, The Foundry and the others. Please sit around the table and fix this. I hope that you enjoyed this video and that you have found some answers to your problems. Please share it and I hope it will make you more vigilant with the color emergency of your workflow. Take care of yourself and see you soon.